Hi, and welcome to a webinar with Dementia South Africa. Today we have Heather Hasman, a dietitian who's going to be speaking to us about nutrition and dementia. Heather, thank you so much for taking the time um, to join us today. Um, a little bit about Heather. Heather completed her bachelor degree in psychology and uh, physiology before training as a dietitian in South Africa at UCT. Um, she joined the practice where she currently is after spending eight years practicing as a community dietitian in the UK. Her 15 years of experience cover a wide range of nutritional areas, including nutritional management of diabetes, cardiac rehabilitation, weight management, and gut conditions with an emphasis on IBS. Knowledge of the importance of the psychology and nutrition therapy, Heather has a passion for motivational counseling and cognitive behavioral therapy. She successfully created and delivered many group programs within diverse and multicultural settings, focusing on the practical aspects of nutrition. Heather enjoys health writing and has contributed to several nutrition related product, excuse me, projects. Um, so Heather, thank you again. We really are excited um, to hear you speak. So from my side, everyone will be muted. If we have time at the end, we'll ask a few questions. Thanks again, Heather, over to you. No problem. Thank you very much for the introduction and hi to everyone. I'm Heather, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. Thank you for Abigail for making the contact. Um, I, as you heard, I'm a dietitian working in private practice, but a lot of my, uh, pr my experience around dementia was when I was working in the UK, and it was around eight years of more community-based dietetics, so I was visiting a lot of people in their homes who couldn't attend clinic, and a lot of it was elderly care and also dementia in nursing homes. And I have a, a very a special interest and bond in terms of this aspect of dietetics because I love working with the elderly, and um, there's such a, a lot of nutritional guidance that is required with this population group. And I hope that the presentation today just kind of touches on the many aspects that are um, involved in nutrition. And thank you for sending through all the questions. I'm going to try and incorporate them as I go through the different slides. So forgive me if I keep just looking to the side um, to see that I've covered all the questions that you have kindly sent through. And if there's any that I didn't cover, I will do them at the end. Um, and if there's more time, then great, um, you can fire away with more questions. So with regards to dementia, I think one of the most difficult things that we have with older persons with dementia is that they are at risk of malnutrition. And malnutrition really is when they have a lack of good nutrition. And this usually comes about because there are so many common eating and drinking challenges. And there's lots of reasons why persons with dementia can have difficulties with eating. So I'm just gonna to touch on some of them. And these are of course um, not the exhaustive list, but um, often people with uh, dementia, depending on what stage they're in, they have a reduced or limited feelings of hunger or thirst. So perhaps they may forget to eat or drink. Uh, they may feel like they have already eaten and then they forget to eat. Um, they also may overeat because they may have forgotten that they've eaten. So this often impacts on their appetite. So some people have a very small appetite and don't feel like eating. There's also a change in preferences and habits. So people may start to enjoy foods that they previously never did. So they might start tending towards more sweet foods uh, where previously they may have never ever touched a sweet or spicy food in their lives. And they may also prefer certain routines and they may actually prefer more fixed routines where previously they had more of a regular eating pattern. And then one of the biggest things that comes with um, dementia is this ability to shop, prepare and cook foods becomes a challenge. So even just recognizing what, food, what to do with the food or how to eat it becomes difficult. difficult. They may also start losing the ability to use their cutlery, so uh, problems with coordination or even hand grip. 
then we see a lot of people, uh, older people with dementia uh, with taking many medications. And that may just be from conditions that they have prior to a diagnosis of di dementia or they have an illness that they need to um, take medication for. Then there may be bowel changes. And I see a lot of questions came through with regards to uh, very loose stools or very constipated stools. And this really is one of, one of the um, challenges when it comes to people with dementia. And it's based on quite a few components and I'll touch on that in a later slide. They may also have, for example, a dry mouth uh, due to reduction in saliva or ch change in the consistency of the saliva. They may drink less, and they may also um, they may also uh, be breathing a lot more through their mouth, so it's dry a little bit more. And then they have difficulties chewing and swallowing, and this is where we really um, need to take care with regards to nutrition to make sure that they are getting a good intake of um, good nutrients. And if they are struggling with maybe mechanical difficulties in chewing with regards to actually um, breaking down the food, or even when they're trying to swallow, they may get difficulties in swallowing. And often a sign is when someone is coughing quite consistently, particularly after drinking liquids. And this is a point where if you feel that someone is having difficulty with swallowing, you may need to get that swallow assessed and check that the textures of the foods that they're eating are at the right um, consistency or maybe even at the right fluid consistency for them to prevent, uh, to prevent choking. So one of the first important components of uh, the guidelines for dementia um, care is making sure that we are regularly screening and monitoring the nutritional status of those who have dementia. So a lot of my experience in the UK was using something called the Malnutrition Universal Screening Tool or the MUST tool. So I used that uh, pretty much with everybody and certainly when someone goes into a, um, a residential care or nursing care, um, this was done very routinely to make sure that we have a baseline of nutritional status on entering um, the facility. But um, there's also something called a mini nutritional, <coughs> excuse me, assessment or an MA, which you can use. And I'm gonna just go through this in the next couple of slides, just to highlight the most important things that are of relevance when analyzing the nutritional status of someone with dementia. And this will also target the very first question that I got, which was um, around the fact that um, people with dementia are often prone to losing weight. And how do we know when someone needs to be concerned about weight loss? So this, um, this nutri nutrition screening tool takes into consideration several factors and you need to complete the screening by filling in the, the boxes based on what is relevant for that person. And you count up the tally at the end. And if the um, score is 11 or less, then you go on to a next assessment. So just taking a look, you can see that it helps you helps to prompt whether somebody has had a reduction in their food intake. If they have had no um, reduction, obviously they get a higher score. Has there been any weight loss in the last three months? And often it's not easy to weigh somebody um, who has, um, if you don't have a scale to hand. So you can always look at visual cues as well as the scale. So often people who are losing weight, they may lose weight in their upper arms or on their calves. And they may, for example, their dentures are not fitting any longer or their rings are a bit looser, or you can start seeing their clothes are fitting a bit looser. So you can also look for sort of visual um, prompts or warning signs where somebody may be losing weight. And it's the three months period that's important because if they're losing weight quite rapidly, that's what we're more concerned about. And obviously the amount of weight. And what about their mobility? So with dementia, we obviously see a lot of a reduction, uh, we see a reduction in mobility. People are not moving the way they used to. And that has implications on quite a few things. Uh, and particularly bowel habits as well. So you can see that if someone is quite mobile, they get a better scoring on your screening. 
Then has someone, um, has any, have they been suffering from any kind of stress or acute disease in the last three months that's going to have impact on um, their overall health? Are there any neuropsychological problems? So it's also just looking at the severity of the dementia. And then if you can, you can do a body mass index, which looks at what their weight is, and it's divided by their height squared. So the, the taller they are and the thinner they are, the lower their BMI. And you'll tally up all of these factors and get a screening score. And certainly doing this um, at the beginning of a patient's journey with, with a carer or in a residential um, or nursing home helps give a baseline as a reference point. So you can see if they've got more than 11 points, they are of a normal nutritional status. Uh, anything below, they start looking at at risk of malnutrition or they are malnourished. If you've got those scores, you'll move on to a second screening, which will look at other components that may be playing a role. So, for example, how independent they are with their, um, with their living, if they're fully dependent or not. It takes a look at how many medications they're taking, because the more medications, the more implications on their nutritional status. And, for example, have they got any pressure sores or skin ulcers where their nutritional requirements may be increased and they may need more um, they may be more at risk. It looks at how many full meals are they eating. So if they're having good three meals a day, they get a higher score. But if we notice they're not eating those regular meals, they'll get a lower score. And then it focuses as well on protein intake. So there was a question as well about um, the, the value of um, protein with regards to your nutritional um, status. So Protein is really important because it's, it's part of our, um, our good nutrition, but it gets a little bit more difficult to make sure that we are keeping our protein intake going when you're having, for example, difficulties chewing or swallowing. So how do you eat a piece of steak or, piece of, or, or a piece of meat if you can't actually chew or, or um, break down that, that meat? So naturally, we see that the protein intake in people with dementia starts reducing. So we need to be aware of that. With regards to um, which protein is better, they're all equally good. Even plant protein is really um, helpful in terms of um, the, the protein content and the fiber content. But something like beans and pulses is great to include in our, in our diet, um, just as much so as we would include red meat or uh, chicken or fish. Obviously, if we have someone who's struggling to chew, we may need to look at the texture and how to actually facilitate improving the texture so that they can take in the adequate amount of, of good protein in the day. So if they're having less protein, it becomes a nutritional um, a warning sign. So we um, will score them less in that score. And looking at how much fluid there, uh, sorry, fruits and vegetables. So it's very, um, it's a natural progression that um, our fruits and vegetables may decline with age and often we neglect this group. So this is a good source of fiber and it's a good source of antioxidants, vitamins and minerals, which is good for immune function. So we don't want to neglect our fruits and vegetables. Specifically, if someone's got difficulties with chewing, they might find the skins on the apples a little bit challenging, and we can adapt their diet accordingly to facilitate if there's any difficulties with that. So this kind of prompts us to pick up if they're not eating um, regular fruits and vegetables, how can we address that? And somebody, I think there was a question about fruits and vegetables, but I'll check again. Uh, with regards to fluid intake, uh, again, naturally, um, our fluid intake uh, decreases as we get older, and you feel less desire to want to drink, um, and the fluid intakes will drop, and this has implications on dehydration and also uh, bowel habits. So the less you're drinking, the less um, your, for your stools can form, and you may get um, a risk of constipation, for example. Uh, assisted feeding. So are the, is the person able to eat on their own? Uh, if they're at home on their own, are they being prompted to eat? Are they just going through the day without um, taking in their meals? And obviously, the more assistance they need, um, the, the, it may put them at risk if they are not actually achieving um, uh, all of those uh, meals through the day. 
All right, self-view of nutritional status. So how are they feeling in themselves? So of course, even with, um, uh, with dementia, there are lots of emotional components around nutrition. So um, are they feeling depressed or anxious? And how do they feel about their general health and their own nutritional status? And then finally, we've got our um, mid upper arm circumferences. That, so that looks at the middle of the, from the shoulder um, down to your elbow bone. And it looks at the middle of your um, arm to see what is the nutritional status showing you your um, muscle, if there's any muscle wasting. And you can also do the calf circumference, which again is another indicator of muscle wasting. So all of that is tallied and you get another malnutrition indicator score. So I kind of went through that quite um, in detail just to give you a, a, an idea of all the things that we will be keeping our eye on with regards to making sure that somebody is not at risk of malnutrition. Okay, so when it comes to um, older persons, they nutritional guidelines are still going to be a healthy balanced diet. And this isn't any different when it comes to older persons with dementia. Uh, in fact, um, a balanced diet is uh, good for allocating all the nutrients we need to maintain our health and to maintain our long-term long cognitive status. So I've just popped in this picture here. This is um, produced by um, Public Health of, uh, of England and it's updated their um, a sort of plate model with regards to um, healthy eating. I really like this image because it gives us a good visual of if you had to put all the foods that you were eating in one day on one plate, what different proportions it would be and what's important in our diet. So you can see that fruits and vegetables are really important in our diet and, and a variety of different fruits and vegetables. Uh, that's the green component on, on the plate. We've got our starchy foods, uh, our breads, pasta, rice, cereals, potatoes, and um, porridges. And we are encouraging a whole grain variety or a higher fiber variety uh, to help facilitate our bowel habits and make sure that we're going, um, got regular bowel motions. You've got the pink component, which is your protein foods. And you can see it's not as big as the other two components, but it's still important. And, roughly a moderate intake during the day. Mm -hmm. And that is your beans, your pulses, your meat, your chicken, your fish, and particularly your omega-3s, which come from your oily fish, which is really good for our, um, our heart health and our brain health. And then we've got our blue, the little blue segment, which is our, our dairy components, your milk, your cheese, your yogurts, um, these are really good for providing calcium and a, a protein source. Again, not as big, a little bit less, so um, still important, but not um, the dominant in our diet. And then the, the tiny little uh, purple section is your foods high in fats and sugars. So there was a question about um, whether the... Um, whether a person could still take in sweet foods if they have a bit of a sweet tooth. And absolutely. So as part of our healthy uh, balanced diet, there is a spot for um, uh, things that you enjoy, uh, more sweeter foods. Uh, but of course, we try as much as possible to give natural sources of sweetness where possible. So things like your fruits and um, your um you know, if you're going to have things like um, honey and jams, it would just be small amounts in the day. And then our oils and uh, fats, uh, again, really important, but our research shows that we steer more towards the plant-based sources of oils uh, as opposed to the more animal-based um, sources of oils. So more of your, um, your nuts, your seeds, give us oils, your, um, uh, your sunflower oil, your olive oil, your... Um, uh, canola oil. These are all really good sources of oil to include. Um, I'm just going to touch on one of the other questions. Somebody asked about um, whether coconut oil was um, beneficial for dementia. Um, I'm not familiar with um, that specific research, but um, we do know that coconut oil, although it does have a nice um, taste and um, flavor to it, it's no, no more better than a um, an equivalent plant-based source. It also has a high saturated fat content, which we know is not, not um, which is more harmful for us um, compared to the plant-based varieties. 
and uh, also looking at our sort of chips, chocolate, sweets, and 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 junk foods, still um, allowed, but very very small amounts um, as part of that healthy balanced diet. Quite a few questions came through um, with regards to uh, bowel habits. So lots of questions with regards to uh, constipation, very loose stools, and whether this is um, something that we can kind of tackle. So with people with dementia, we do see um, an alteration in bowel habits, and there's lots of factors that can affect this. Mostly uh, due to our, our intake changing, um, that could be if you're not eating regularly, you don't have the adequate bulk to produce our waste products in our intestine or our stools. So a, so a poor appetite is going to affect that. Also, if you're having difficulty swallowing um, or you have a texture change, so you may be naturally lowering the intake of um, your fiber in your diet um, and you may be not um, swallowing as you used to. Um, this is going to impact on the amount of fiber that you're taking in through the diet. We also have a natural reduction in fluids, or it may be difficult to achieve the fluid intake in the day. So this is going to impact on the consistency of the stool. And we're not moving as much. So um, we, that activity is not stimulating the movement of the bowels. And a lot of people are taking a lot of medications. So these are all going to impact on your bowel habits. So some things that can help um, with that is really making sure that um, we're achieving adequate fluid during the day. So looking at a person with dementia, even just monitoring what they're taking in, you know, did they have a cup of tea? Did they have a glass of water? Um, did they have a glass of milk? These can all contribute to the fluid intake over the day. And if they're not getting um, adequate fluid, try and find ways to improve on this. And First and foremost, in terms of diet, we really encourage fiber as part of uh, the diet. Um, you know, your fruits and vegetables uh, are really good as snacks, as part of our meals. Um, even things like oats, oat bran, bran flakes, your wheat bix. If you're having soups, you can add things like um, split peas or lentils to give extra fiber. Um, or, or your porridges in the morning, trying to stay away from the ones that don't give adequate fiber but that have a sort of whole wheat or high fiber uh, component. Uh, of course, this needs to be done gradually. If someone is not used to having a lot of fiber in their diet, you need to slowly put this back in one step at a time so that they can adjust to an increase in fiber. And that fiber gives bulk to the stool and softness to the stool to allow it to move through the colon and have a bowel movement. Also worth mentioning that as, as your, your um, chewing difficulties uh, become more present, um, this, is, this is where often you um, remove fiber from your diet. So for example, you might naturally go to a more softer food that doesn't have that fiber content, but we can find ways around that. For example, you could um, use a fruit pulp or a puree. You can take the skins off the apple and grate that, or you could mash a banana or um, mash a pawpaw. Um, but if, obviously, if this, this doesn't um, play a role, then we can really include them in our diet where possible. Also encouraging um, the people you know to move as much as possible. So um, walking around the house, if it's, um, if it's a, if they're able to do that, um, and just trying to get them to move, um, to have some activity during the day. Um, have an awareness of medications. So uh, certain medications are gonna play a role in bowel habits and also have they been on any um, antibiotics as well, which is going to impact on their, um, their stools and their bowel habits. What laxatives are they on? Maybe the doctor has prescribed some laxatives and having a knowledge around that um, is really good to understand uh, how this is playing a role in the person's bowel habits. And um, somebody, uh, there was quite a few questions with regards to um, loose stools or runny stools. And often this might be because the person is more constipated and you get quite a lot of bowel accumulation. And, they may be given laxatives or maybe um, they have um, 
stools that come past that are quite loose. And that may, you may think that they're having diarrhea, but it's actually called something, uh, it's actually called overflow constipation. So you've got the constipation as the predominant bowel habit, but you're getting this um, almost liquid coming past and it, you think that it's diarrhea, but actually you need to tackle the constipation as the underlying condition. So um, almost monitoring um, bowel habits, I'm just gonna go back to that Bristol stool chart that gives us an idea of what our stools are kind of looking like. So if, you're, if you can take a, a little diary and just make notes of when a person is opening their, their bowels and maybe just have a look at what, whether it's more hard or lumpy versus whether it's more loose and watery. And if they're having more hard and, and um, lumpy stools uh, more often, greater than 25% of the time, they're more constipated than they are um, normal. So just having a, an awareness of this and monitoring that can help give you a, a good gauge of whether someone is um, erring towards the, um, going towards constipation or diarrhea. Um, just tackling a little bit about, about um, if someone is having difficulty with swallowing um, or chewing, there are um, ways to actually take, uh, manage what the person is eating through um, adjusting the texture. Of course, uh, this, it's really important to work with um, someone who can assess a swallow if you feel this is um, a problem for um, a person with dementia. And they can work with um, the person to see what is the the safest food to swallow and chew. So they can even say that if someone is struggling with liquids, they can thicken the liquids. Um, and if somebody is struggling with say normal consistency of food, they may need something like a puree diet or a soft diet, which may facilitate and aid swallowing. They also can assess how a person swallows. So perhaps make sure that they're seated upright and not slouching to make sure that they're in a, a good position to have a safe swallow. Because if somebody is not um, having a safe swallow, there's a risk of aspiration, which means that food can get lodged in the lungs. And obviously we don't want that. So different textures of foods, we've obviously got our nor normal consistency and then we've got our soft diet. And a soft diet is where um, foods are really put to a consistency where they are easy to chew, they may be minced or mashed, um, they often have a gravy or a sauce to make them moist to assist swallowing so it doesn't get stuck. They may have a removal of pips, nuts and, sea, and skins of certain fruits and vegetables and certain foods that kind of get lodged in the, in the mouth like rice um, or breads or even crackers sometimes get, get stuck in, in the mouth and pulled here. So um, you have to avoid those uh, where necessary. That's a soft diet. And then there's one step further, which is the puree diet, which is a completely smooth and pureed consistency. So I've popped in here some pictures of um, what this may look like with regards to somebody who's following a soft textured diet. These resources are all available from a great uh, resource from the Caroline Walker Trust. And she, uh, that, that trust uh, does a lot of work and um, practical information for people who are uh, just older people and people with dementia. And you can feel free to um, download this resource. They have got pages and pages of sample meal plans and um, examples of what a day would be, or even just a week um, of what it would look like for a soft textured diet and uh, a puree diet, which I'm gonna show you now. So you can have a look here and see that a breakfast would still have the same balance. So you've still got your whole grain um, carbohydrates, you've still got your fruits and vegetables, and uh, you've still got your um, potential for a yogurt or a dairy and maybe good fat. So um, for the breakfasts here, you can see it's got the fiber, but it's just at a soft texture. And a main meal would still have the same components, but it's just maybe mashable or with a gravy or a sauce. Here's some images of um, more the puree or soft diet, uh, soft foods. Um, again, um, everything is really smooth to uh, smooth consistency and texture, so very easy to swallow, and, and nothing's going to get stuck. Um, and if this is applicable, you can see that there's still color, um, there's still um, balance in the in the plate, and some really good ideas here to make sure that you're getting a good nutritious meal despite the fact that it has been texturally changed.
I'm just going to touch on some finger foods as well, because often with uh, dementia, um, people can get quite frustrated because they maybe lack the strength to cut foods or even just to feed themselves. Uh, maybe they're also just feeling like they don't want to eat. But finger foods can be a great addition to um, the day to encourage people to eat when they maybe don't feel like it. And also to give them the independence that they may feel they have lost because they can't actually cut their food or uh, feed themselves. And here's just some examples of some finger foods to um, just uh, uh, make sure that you're still getting that balance and still getting all the nutrients you need, but it's just in a different format. So breakfast might be um, hard, uh, quartered hard-boiled eggs, um, fruit segments, uh, seedless grapes, buttered muffins, main meals um, might be um, kebabs or fish fingers, fish cakes, small potatoes, all things that you could pick up and eat yourself. Lun lunches could include sandwiches, um, cheese on toast, um, vegetable sticks, and puddings and snacks as well, you know, uh, individual fruit pieces, biscuits, crackers, cheese, um, hot cross buns. And again, here are these resources from the Caroline Walker Trust. Um, somebody asked about what does a, a normal meal look, a, a normal daily uh, meal intake look for someone who has, for someone who has dementia. And this is just an example of finger foods for um, breakfast and main meals. Again, you can see there's good balance, good variety, good color, and all of these can be eaten with your fingers, giving that independence and giving that, um, that enjoyment when it comes to food. So what about if someone is losing weight? You've noticed that they're losing weight and Preventing weight loss is really important, and sometimes people just have a smaller appetite. Uh, there was also a question about um, whether someone has to, has to eat three meals a day or whether the timing is important. But actually, what's more important is over the course of the day, are we encouraging maybe more regular meals and snacks as opposed to forcing them someone to eat three meals a day? When you don't have a big appetite and someone puts a very large meal in front of you, it may put them off completely. So rather focusing on smaller, more manageable meals more often might be a better approach. And if someone prefers or eats better in the morning, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe focus on this time of day more so than in the afternoon where they may want to have a nap or they may feel a little bit more sluggish or tired where, they may, where they're not going to eat as well. So harness the times that the person is gonna eat the best. And throughout the day, you can encourage nutritious snacks, uh, uh, like, for example, yogurts, milk drinks, um, or soups, so that when they do eat, you almost make it count. Other ways to actually add energy and add protein to the meals to help improve the, the nutritional content of the foods without necessarily changing the volume, this is called food fortification. And you can do this by adding protein to the to foods like adding milk, cheese, yogurts, milk powder, peanut butter to different foods. Uh, you could even um, sprinkle nuts and seeds if they can uh, manage to chew that. Uh, you can add blended chicken to a vegetable soup or beans and pulses to a, um, a plain vegetable soup to add protein. You can also add energy by using, for example, full fat milk in your sauces or drinks or cereals. You can add good fats like olive oils, uh, cheese, uh, margarine to different soup sauces and vegetables. And you can add things like jam and honey to porridge and puddings. So along the lines of persons who have diabetes, if you are thinking of, uh, uh, of someone who's losing weight, it's often acute. So we want to make sure that that priority is met. We don't want them to lose any more weight. We want their weight to stabilize. And in this case, it's okay to include things like sugar and um, jams and honey and sweeter drinks where they, we want to basically make sure that they're not going to lose any more weight. Obviously, once their weight is settled and they are stable in their weight and eating well, we can go back to um, more sort of healthier balanced guidelines to make sure that they're not overdoing it. But Often people ask, well, you know, the person has diabetes, I can't give them jam and sugar, but we need to focus on the acute situation, which is if someone is losing weight, we need to make sure that they're 
that they're not going to continue losing weight. So think of this as an acute treatment to help them um, to prevent losing extra weight. Of course, these guidelines are, are very um, broad. And if you want any more specific guidelines, you can always ask a healthcare professional to guide you with that. We also have nourishing drinks you can offer. Usually your milky based drinks are the best. Um, you can also give fruit juice. And there are also um, uh, products on the market that are nutritional supplement drinks that if someone is um, not eating well and losing weight, they, they are um, things like Ensure and Fresubin that are available um, on the market. And of course, you can speak to your doctor a little bit more about this if this is required. There are also drinks that have fiber in them. So if somebody is struggling with bowel habits, you can add uh, you can maybe focus on those drinks as opposed to the non-fiber options. Uh, I just put, put this one in here as well um, to cover, um, I, I, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it, it, it's just an example of, a, of, of what would, would be a healthy um, whole day menu for someone who's eating a normal diet um, and making sure they're meeting their requirements based on that of an older person. So. <clears throat> you can see it includes three meals and snacks, but obviously this is not um, fixed and set in stone. It's all dependent on the person. And this again is from the Caroline Walker Trust as well. So I'm coming near to the end in case I didn't answer all the questions. Um, just some other practical tips that can help um, with meal times. And I think the most important thing to remember is that people with dementia, they still really need to enjoy their meals. And eating should not be a chore and it should not be unpleasant and there's so many things that play a role in terms of a good environment um, to help facilitate good eating so try and prepare for meals and make it almost an activity that is relaxed and calm make it so that the person who has dementia is involved in the activity so make sure that they could maybe help set the table or maybe they can help even with the with the meal preparation make conversations so encourage them to talk about um, different smells or uh, different memories or recipes just to encourage um, uh, a happy time around eating Make sure that when someone sits down to eat, they don't then need to go to the toilet. So make sure that toilets, um, the toilet has uh, um, been done before the meal starts. Make sure that they can actually see the food and they can hear properly and their dentures are in place. So they can eat well and they can enjoy the experience. If someone is struggling with um, their cutlery, you can get adapted cutlery. Um, you can buy that, um, that uh, and of course like wine handles facilitate picking up a cup or on a fork and avoid too many distractions so um, often we might put lots of things on the table and it can be quite confusing and um, there's lots of patterns or, or decorations keep it very simple a knife fork and plate a uh, glass and but still making it pleasant you may um, also consider something like a plate warmer if someone takes a really long time to eat. It can keep the food warm so that when they actually get to their last portions, they don't get a cold um, portion of food. Um, also, helping the person to see the colors of the plate a little bit better. So having contrasting colored plates. And if you saw in that, um, this one pic in these pictures, you can see the plate is blue um, to contrast maybe very um, light colors like potatoes or mash. And um, primary colors obviously are the best. Keep the room bright so that it is easier to see. And of course, the more company you have, you can imagine if you're isolated and alone, you really don't feel like eating. But if you have company and that's a possibility, then sharing a meal time is always um, great and eating together and really just spending time. And they've done a lot of research in um, nursing homes to show that when they facilitate um, shared eating times, the, the amount of food taken in is much better. And then also ensuring good oral hygiene after a meal. So if someone needs to rinse um, or clean their mouth, this is really important for um, oral hygiene. Also, if someone, if you've noticed, has uh, their tastes have changed, 
Um, just keep trying a variety of different foods. Um, keep a list of things they've tried or that they preferred. You can add spices or herbs to en enhance flavors. Just watch out for extra salts because uh, this can have impact on blood pressure. Um, you can also accept unusual combinations. So if somebody really wants something that you may think is odd, um, but they're eating it and they're enjoying it and it is healthy and balanced, uh, they can go for it. Um, also something like, um, you know, having a white clean table mat. So if there's spillage or um, someone is um, knocking food off the plate or messing because they're trying to get the food while they're eating, um, it's not too much of a fuss just to wipe it clean. And really encourage and talk. Um, the more encouragement we give to people who are struggling, the, the, the better they will do. And then, of course, um, there's always the option of finger foods if this is needed. So I think that came to the end of my presentation. However, there were some questions that I just wanted to go through and make sure that I've covered completely. So... Um, one of the questions was regarding if there's a food that can assist a person to swallow their medication without it getting stuck in the throat or having a coughing fit. So as I mentioned, if somebody is coughing, particularly on liquids, this is a, a warning sign that they need to maybe have their swallow assessed. Um, you can get a pill crusher as well, um, but obviously you need to discuss this with your doctor or your pharmacist. And um, the most easiest might be getting a um, uh, a syrup form of medication so that they are um, able to um, swallow that a little bit easier. But as I said, um, trying to force someone to take a pill if they're going to choke on that, um, we really need to assess that a little bit deeper to make sure that they're not having um, a coughing fit. And there was a question on uh, what is the difference between red meat, fish, and chicken with regards to ease of digestion? So I mentioned that all of these are good quality proteins. Um, none of them is, is going to be uh, better in terms of digestion other than how you actually, if they can swallow it and chew it. So making your um, protein sources uh, easy to swallow or maybe mincing it or blending it, if that is a problem, that is going to be more important with regards to the types of protein. But all good value protein is important in terms of our nutritional status. Um, is ice cream one of the essential food groups? Um, maybe. <laughs> um, Yes, as I said, ice cream is definitely part of a, a part of our, our diet. And if somebody really enjoys ice cream, I, I wouldn't tell them not to have it. Um, but again, as part of a healthy, balanced diet, we just really look at that balance and encourage them to on most of the time to have good, nutritious food. And there is that place for um, foods that someone enjoys. Um, has a bone broth has been recommended? Any thoughts on this? So. Um, bone broths, I haven't got any specific research on um, uh, the relationship with dementia um, specifically, um, but again, it's, it's a protein source so, um, and collagen, and I, I would imagine that a good um, chicken breast will also do the trick. Uh, is vegetarian protein of value like beans and pulses? Yes, I've mentioned that they are equally good in terms of adding nutritional um, content to our meals. The, new, the protein content is not as high as compared to meats and chicken and fish, but they absolutely have their place in terms of a good balanced diet. Um, my brother enjoys lots of sweets. Uh, he doesn't have diabetes, but will this have a negative effect on him? Um, absolutely. Um, uh, with regards to sweets, anything in excess, you have to also gauge um, a very high sugar and processed food intake is not always going to be helpful for cognitive um, uh, ability later on. So we really try and encourage, yes, if you want to include some sweets and sweet treats, that's absolutely fine. But when it starts taking over and becomes the dominant feature in the diet, then you need to just assess on other ways that you can try and naturally sweeten somebody's um, diet. My husband takes warfarin and other heart medication. Is there anything special to watch out with regards to diet as dementia progresses, um, apart from normal warfarin issues? So um, with warfarin, there is some research around um, 
uh, vitamin K in certain fruits and vegetables. And we're often advised not to eat fruits and uh, not to eat too many green leafy vegetables. But actually, if you start warfarin and you, your diet um, contains gr uh, green leafy vegetables, um, you don't need to stop doing that. As part of your titration, um, you could keep your diet um, as you want to have it, and then they will manage the warfarin accordingly. And if your diet is including your healthy balance of fruits and vegetables, um, that should be okay. Um, there are certain heart medications um, where I believe um, grapefruit is a contraindication with regards to effectiveness. Um, but other than that, I don't see anything specifically with regards to warfarin, only just making sure that you don't suddenly change your diet radically and um, don't monitor the um, the warfarin, the clotting rates with your um, GP. And I think that was all of them. Um, uh, with regards to um, constipation and runny tummy, I mentioned the importance of um, fiber, fluids, mobility, and uh, making sure you have a good awareness around if any laxatives are on a uh, are, are part of the medicated list, have they had any antibiotics, and just keeping a good record of that. So, um, you know, does the person have a good uh, bowel pattern? Are they drinking enough fluids? Maybe just jotting that down and taking note of that can help um, make sure that you don't run into trouble and you can adjust um, accordingly. So I think those are all the questions. Um, I hope I've covered them um, correctly and I'm not used to just rambling on for um, so long. So it's I you were amazing. Were exasperated, exasperated breath. Um, and I'm gonna leave it at that um, while I drink some water. <laughs> Heather, thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry for the feedback. We're in the office and a few people um, have their computers on. Sorry about that. Um, you were amazing. I think let's open it up to the floor if anybody has any questions that we haven't addressed. Um, and we can, then, we can then take it from there. I think um, if we want to use the raise hand function or the chat function, we can do that. Um, if anyone has anything that they'd like to ask. There was um, um, there was a question. Okay, you've addressed the, the thing about the warfarin. Um, I'm not sure, did, did we touch on, somebody wrote um, that their brother enjoys lots of sweet stuff. He doesn't have diabetes, but could that have a negative effect um, on one and kind of induce diabetes was the question, I think. Uh, well, yeah, as I mentioned, the um, people who have dementia, the healthy eating guidelines are still going to be the same. And even if someone has diabetes, we encouraged a, a balanced approach. So, um, yes, they need to be more vigilant with regards to very sweet foods and adding sugar to their diet. But um, as part of a healthy diet, they are allowed to have some sugar. So... We don't want to stop people eating all kinds of, of foods they enjoy. So I kind of feel like it's a balanced approach. So if somebody wants to um, have sweets in their diet, it's okay, but you have to look at the bigger picture. So is that dominating their diet and are they having far too much, far too many sweets? Um, then yes, the, the impact on refined sugars and, um, and unhealthy fats is going to play a role on our overall health. And if we don't have a good nutritional status, it does put us at risk factors for, for developing conditions later on in life. So it could worsen the cognitive, um, it could have cognitive decline for, and has implications for dementia. And it also leads to potential uh, other chronic diseases like diabetes and heart problems. And also our weight. So if we are carrying a lot of weight and we are consuming quite a lot of sugary, um, fatty foods, then yes, we have to be a bit more um, uh, aware of that. And certainly people with dementia might overeat. And this is because maybe they've forgotten that they've eaten something or they might forget that they've eaten a bag of sweets and um, making sure that they um, don't actually then come and eat another pack of sweets. So all of these things have to play a role in our mind in making sure that 
um, if a person is overeating and they're overweight, we need to address that. But if someone doesn't have diabetes, they're at a good nutritional status and they're eating a good balanced diet, having a, you know, the occasional um, sweet treat is okay. But it's when it's, it's taking over our diet, we then have to say, yes, refined sugars and, and, and sugary foods are going to play a role as a risk factor for certain um, conditions. Great, thank you, thank you so much. So Lynn has asked, can you suggest ingredients of a summer fruit smoothie that could be good for maintaining good bowel function? Uh, yeah, so um, definitely fruits and vegetables um, are really great as part of um, helping maintain good bowel practices. But if someone can actually eat um, without any chewing difficulties or swallowing difficulties, if someone can eat an actual piece of fruit, that is the best. So if you can eat an apple or a banana, um, those are going to be the most helpful in terms of making sure you get the good types of fiber in the intact fruit. So like, for example, an apple, you eat the apple skin and the inside of the apple, which gives a good mix of fiber to allow for good bowel function. If you're going to have a smoothie, um, it's absolutely fine to do that. Um, we just watch out how many fruits we're putting in. So often it's easy to put the entire fruit bowl in our fruit smoothie and drink, you know, a liter of a fruit smoothie. So just bear, bear in mind as well that they, that might be just too much in one sitting. But um, definitely all the very colorful fruits are, are really great. So <clears throat> the higher, the, you know, the, the deeper the color and the richer the color, the more antioxidants. So you've got your, um, you know, your blueberries and your, um, uh, your colorful um, uh, apples and, <clears throat> excuse me, all the, um, you know, mainly the berries. And then also you can add things as well, like oat bran, um, nuts and seeds to actually give a little bit more um, fiber oomph and make sure that you um, are not just having fruit, you're having um, some extra um, nutrients and fiber into that. And then vegetables as well are really great to add to a smoothie and maybe add a little bit less sugar. So they, um, you know, your spinach, your um, kiwi fruits, your, uh, sorry, that's not a vegetable, your, your um, cucumber, your, um, all your different herbs, all of these contribute to um, plant-based diversity, but not necessarily adding as much sugar. I hope that helped. So lots of greeny colors and oranges and yellows. That's great. And then we have a question that says, if you could let us know what your thoughts on whey protein are. Oh, sorry. I think there was a question on whey protein. So again, um, you know, whey, pro whey protein is, um, I, think, uh, I, think, I think I missed that question. It's ringing a bell to me now. I think it was something about whey protein and um, does it cause constipation? So I think you need to ask the question, um, it's more the holistic, the whole diet, as a, the diet as a whole, as opposed to when, um, you know, necessarily the, the whey protein supplement causing constipation. So as I said, there's multiple factors that can play a role. Um, whey protein, again, has its place in terms of offering a protein component to um, our diets. Um, it's, it depends on what you're looking for with regards to a supplement. So if you're trying to get quick and convenient um, you can add whey protein to different foods to give it a protein boost. Um, but even just something like a milk, you know, so plain milk, skim milk powder can also be fine. Um, but I don't see any reason why whey protein would be contraindicated in constipation. Um, but again, food is always the best. So if you can get someone to eat just the basic foods and you're not having any problem with that, that's always going to be the best. So your actual whole, your whole chicken, your fish, your beans, your pulses, all of your, even your, your milk products, um, that's going to be best. But if you feel that there's a need for um, boosting someone's um, a diet, you can, you can have whey protein. It's just not something that we sort of actively go out and recommend, but it definitely has a place if, if in the right context. Great. Um, thank you. I, um, does anybody, we're nearly kind of to our time and you've been, I mean, the, the messages are just flooding in about how incredibly informative um, uh, the oh, session is. <laughs> it's it's such a, a massive topic and I, I just can't cover it all. I mean, I could even put in a slide on the different types of laxatives, but um, there's just so many, um, so much to cover and, and, and it all depends really on the person. I think at the, at the key the most important message is just to keep regularly monitoring um, and assessing whether someone is eating well and their nutritional status is at its at its optimum. 
Heather, if we, so as I mentioned to you when we spoke, uh, um, when we spoke um, on the phone, um, so I'm just, um, is, is a big part of this group is our support group that we run on Thursdays. And a big topic that often comes up is the laxative conversation. We've got five minutes left. I don't know, I've gotten, I see no hands up, but if you maybe just wanted to, if you're able to just touch on um, some kind of salient points around what laxatives are suggested, um, is that possible? Yep. Um, uh, just before I talk about that, I just saw another one coming up with regards to the carers and the resources available. Um, UK have a main, obviously because I worked in the UK, um, the, they have amazing resources and it's really important for carers as well to look after themselves. So um, having that knowledge about how to look after um, your, the person living with dementia, but you also need to take care of yourself. And there's so many resources out there and definitely the Caroline Walker Trust is really good in terms of they have that really good document. There's other organizations that really focus on the practicalities of making sure that we support people who are carers and who, and who have dementia. So make reference of that. Um, use those resources and, and I'm sure I can send the link to you, Abigail, with regards to downloading that document um, just to read through. I mean, it's pages and pages of good ideas. Absolutely. And, you can and, can share it with yeah. and then just quickly with regards to the laxatives, yes. So laxatives get quite tricky because there's quite a lot on the market and some of them are useful and some of them are maybe not so useful. So um, when it comes to our different types of, of laxatives, um, you get a stimulant type laxatives, which are sort of more like your Sena. And we try and go for more the osmotic laxatives, which are like um, Movicol. So with the stimulant laxatives, they don't necessarily encourage our, our, our gut to keep thinking and to keep working. But we focus more on the osmotic laxatives that basically means that they, they manage the water flux in and out of the bowel and, and help soften the stool. So Movico is often one that's used um, on the market um, and, and you really need to understand how to use it correctly. So um, it's not something that you just kind of give once and hope that you um, that you, you, you take it until you get a, a, a stool passing. You've actually got to take it correctly to make sure that you're getting a regular pattern of bowels and you adjust that with the diet to make sure that you're not getting too runny a stool and not getting too, um, too hard a stool. Um, there are also um, uh, things like Dulcolax that are often prescribed and these are usually uh, given at night to help um, uh, to mimic sort of the stimulant uh, react, the, the stimulation of our bowels overnight, um, but again, that has implications of when you're going to take it. Um, you also have fiber gel, which is um, showing a lot more um, evidence in the research with regards to actually bulking up our stools. So fiber gel also is a really good um, uh, uh, supplement for someone who is both constipated or has loose stools. So what it does is it, it bulks up the stools if you're struggling to go to the toilet, and it also softens the stool um, if you um, have got a very runny stool. So fiber gel, you can also get um, on uh, in the pharmacy or over the counter. And it's best to discuss this with the doctor and even with a dietitian or even a nurse to make sure that they're actually taking it correctly and they're taking it at the right um, dosage and how they're taking that with regards to their diet. So sometimes someone might be taking a high dosage of laxatives and maybe they have enough ad adequate fiber in their diet so you can actually um, work with the person to, to get a, a balance. Um, but the, it all starts at the beginning with monitoring someone's bowel patterns to see what is actually happening. And then you work with the doctor in terms of the dosage and how that's actually impacting on their, on their stool patterns. So I, I'm just the laxes off the top of my head. I don't want to recommend any products because um, I'm not here to recommend, but um, there's definitely um, quite a few out there. But um, we've got the stimulant at laxatives, the osmotic laxatives, and then the, the actual fiber, which is like your espagula husk or your cili cilium husk, which is your fiber gel, which has got a few other things. Also, pedicol, I think, is one of them as well. Um, so there's quite a, an array, and um, it would be good to um, go through how they work a little bit different, because they all work a little bit differently, and also to know um, whether what people are actually taking. So um, you can... I can give advice on that. Sorry, is that very vague? Oh, that's, that's, <laughs> terrific. that's terrific, Heather. We we really, really, really appreciate that. And people are just, yeah, people are um, 
yeah, people are just absolutely loving this, this talk. So thank you so, so, so much. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say thank you to you from Dementia SA. We so greatly appreciate your time and your effort. It's a pleasure. Um,